and we will send you a link to the recording as well as the slide deck later this week. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's the questions bar. Uh, one more slide, please. My name is Allison Whitwer and I'm on the CAP program team. My colleagues and I work for TRC and we implement the program on behalf of PG&E. Any inquiries or correspondences with the program will be with us, but PG&E is the source of the incentives and the vision behind the program. Next slide, please. CAP is the single family new construction program that offers incentives to builders for building more efficient and energy conscious homes. TRC also implements a multifamily program with the same goals known as the California Multifamily New Homes Program, also known as CMF&H. Both of these programs are developed to help participants prepare for code changes and strive for zero net energy. They are funded under the auspices of the California Public Utilities Commission. Next slide. To qualify for the program, a project must be within PG&E territory for gas and or electricity. You must be going above Title 24 Energy Code and all homes must be single family, duplexes or townhomes. Energy consultants that participate in the program must hold a 2013 or 2016 residential CEA certificate. Uh, before I hand the presentation over to our speaker, I wanted to launch a quick poll just so that we know who is in our audience. Uh, please select either an energy consultant, HERS rater, builder or developer, architect, or utility representative. All right, so just a few more seconds. So it looks like the majority of people on the call today are energy consultants, and we have a little bit of everything. There's also some HERS raters, quite a few developers, architects, and some utility representatives. All right. So today our speaker is Ritesh Nair. He is a technical manager with TRC and our CAP plan, our CAP plan review manager. His main focus is on California residential new construction programs. You can take it from here, Ritesh. All right, thanks, Alison. Welcome, everyone. Um, in today's webinar, we will be going over the context of the code change. Um, we'll talk about the history of the code, what are the big, bold energy efficiency strategies, um, the legislative changes that are, that are happening, um, the issues and challenges that come with that. We'll also go over the definitions of ZNE, the goals of ZNE, the lessons that we have learned um, from from those um, TDV. Uh, we'll also talk about the definition of TDV and what is uh, changing in 2019 in terms of TDV uh, as compared to the 2016 code. Um, and then last uh, but not the least, you know, we'll be talking of about the 2019 energy code, uh, what changes uh, we should expect. Um, and uh, we'll take any questions, um, you know, at the end of the webinar. Um, all right. So how it all started, um, the Warren Alquist Act in 1975 established the Energy Commission. Um, what's, what was happening in 1975? There was the Watergate scandal. There was the inflation. There was a global recession going on. Uh, the Vietnam War ended. There was the OPEC uh, embargoes. There was gas uh, shortages. All this led to the creation of um, California Energy Commission. Now on the right side, the chart that you're seeing um, is the per capita electricity consumption of California versus, or not versus California and the rest of the United States. Um, the red line is, red, uh, is the rest of the U US. As you can see that from 1975, the per capita electricity consumption for the US has gone up. Uh, but for California, it has remained pretty much consistent. You know, the KWH consumption per person in the state of California has remained consistent. Um, now, what will happen in the next 10 years, uh, we don't know. With so many electric gadgets in the, in the home, uh, with, you know, people talking about z &E, people talking about all electric homes, um, whether this goes up or, you know, it remains flat is yet to be seen. 
but just just for the fact that it has remained consistent um i think we all receive um you know uh, a pat on our back just to just because it has remained consistent now the, what happened between 1975 and today what you're seeing on your screen is basically the bars um in three different bars those are the regulated loads um that we we are focusing on today uh the purple one is your space heating the green one is space cooling um the blue one is water heating as you can see from 1970s to 2016 uh those bars have significantly gone down uh in terms of um your uh you know the total total usage now what do we need to do go to go from 2016 to 2019 as you can see on the on the graph the those bars look you know it to some person if i'm looking at this graph it looks very simple but it's not that simple a lot of effort needs to be made a lot of uh, yeah effort have to be made by all the parties you know from california energy commission to the builders to the energy consultant to the utility representatives everyone needs to to bring on you know more more effort to take take it to the 2019 code what are the big bold energy efficiency strategies the first one uh, we know that is by all all new residential construction in california have to be zne by 2020 all new commercial construction in the in california have to be zne by 2030 50% of your existing commercial buildings have to be retrofitted to zne by 2030 and all new and major renovations for state buildings have to be zne by 2025 now those were the you know big bold energy efficiency strategies to to support them what are the legislative changes that we are seeing the first one that came out is the ab802 uh, which talks about the state wide building energy use the benchmarking um sb350 what it means what it says is that by 2030 your renewable portfolio standards for each year utility has to be 50%. There has to also be a 50% increase in the energy efficiency in the existing buildings. Prop 39 talks about the clean energy funding. AB 32, SB 32 talks about the global warming solution acts. You know, they they are saying that 80% um your greenhouse gas emissions have to be below uh 1990 um uh, by 2050. That is the AB 32 and SB 32 uh bills. now what is the definition of zne everyone talks about you know we need to be zne for by 2020 for for rest new construction for commercial new construction by 2030 but what exactly is a zne there are various definitions out there in the market some people would like to call it zero net source energy some want to call it zero net site energy some want to call it zero net tdv energy basically they all talk about the same thing in different in different aspects like is like for example zne source energy it means it says a house with that produces as much energy energy as it consumes over the course of a year when that energy is counted as the source that includes your site energy what you're consuming at your home plus all the energy which is consumed in your extraction processing and transportation of your primary fuels um to the to the source on the other hand the zero net site energy says a house need will be called a zne zero zero net uh, net site energy when it consumes uh, as much energy as it produces at the site a uh, zero emissions building uh, the definition says that it a house that produces or purchases purchases enough emissions free renewable energy to offset emissions from all the from all energy used in the building over the course of a year does the any make sense is it feasible there is a lot of a lot of people have this confusion you know um why because for for decades you know the the the, the you know generating electricity at the big power plants was has been the most cost effective way people have always thought 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 that you know is that is the most cost effective way uh but what is the problem of doing that there is problem of you know energy losses you have leaks you have emissions and now um the solar pv has become even more cost effective 
you know, so does generating electricity at big power plant is still most cost effective? No, there are other ways to do that. Now, to get to ZE, you know, uh, focus uh, should be on production of energy is not enough. Like the, the first go to, um, you know, rule that people do is just add more PV panels to the roof. But does, is that the only answer? It's not because what happens is when you add more PV panels, you are, you know, playing with the grid and grid is primarily a delivery system. It's not there to store energy. The, you know, the grid system in the US is very, very old. The infrastructure is goes way, way back to 1970s or even before that. So uh, just adding more solar panels is not, not the option or not the, not the answer to go to ZE. You need to achieve, you need to install energy efficiency measures in the building, and then you need to add more renewable energy. A combination of those two will lead you to a ZNE. Uh, the next slide I'll show you why you know we cannot just base um, uh, why we cannot assume renewables are not the not the answer. This particular chart that I got is from Kaiso, uh, CAISO, CAISO.com. You can go to that, and it gives you. Uh, the you know the renewable energy usage for each day. Um, now, what we are looking on our screen is a winter storm that occurred in on the 10th of January 2017. What happened on that day was lots of rains, winds, and clouds. Um, because there was a lot of wind, the blue line that you are seeing is basically your wind energy. So the wind contributed uh, you know significantly for the renew renewable energy generation. The sun, the solar energy, you know, you can see that it started peaking at seven in the morning and then it went down considerably around 3 p.m. or 2 p.m. because there was there was a lot of rain, there was a lot of clouds. Um, one thing to focus uh, our attention is on the on the y-axis. The y-axis talks about the megawatts of renew, renewable energy generation. So the solar on that particular day was able to produce somewhere around 5,300 megawatts. Um, the the wind was able to generate around 3,300 megawatts. Uh, the next slide is a typical spring day, 19th March. Um, I took that slide. Um, was you know it was mostly cloudy, no, not a wind, not a lot of wind. So you see that the wind energy, the blue line is all the way at the down. You know it was producing somewhere around 800 to 200 megawatts uh, on that particular day. That's a 24-hour period. Uh, the sun, however, you know, started peaking at seven. Uh, so I'm sorry, the solar energy. The, uh, the, it started peaking at around seven, and it rim, it it came down around 5 p.m. So again, because it was a cloudy day, uh, we were not able to capture most of the, you know, the solar energy uh, on that particular day. The next slide uh, talks about three things you know it, it tells you the dotted line tells you an hour by hour an actual demand forecast done by the utility the blue solid line is an actual demand what is the actual demand on the grid and the green line is your net demand so the net demand is basically your actual demand minus the renewables um, available on that particular day as you can see that you know from 10 a.m in the morning to like 2 p.m that green line is all the way down. Why? Because you know your actual demand is around 27,000 megawatts, but your renewable is able to match almost you know 6,000 megawatt of that energy. It was able to provide that day. So your green bar is all the way down. But what happens after 3 p.m. or what happens at 5 p.m.? You know um, that green line and the blue line always is, is like it comes very close to each other. What that means is a lot of reasons. One is, you know, everyone comes back home from, from work. We all have so many electric gadgets. We all start charging our phones. We have your, our electric vehicles. We put them on the charging station. So your actual demand and net demand uh, comes very close because A, you don't have much battery storage or the storage system. The sun has gone down. A uh, lot of people are at home and you have more energy consumption. The next one is the spring. So the same same graph, what happened on the spring day is uh, your net demand started uh, maxing out around 7 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. Why? Because we had more solar energy. 
we had you know uh, we had more more renewable energy for that particular day this particular graph that you're seeing you know that curve the green line that goes all the way down from 8 a.m. and starts peaking at 6 p.m. is called the dark curve, which looks something like this, you know. Um, and all, what you, you can see, I, I know a lot of people on this on this webinar have seen this uh, curve over and over again. Um, so I just wanted uh, to, to just, you know, bring it again to, to your attention. Um, what that means is um, the, the the sudden neck, you know, the neck, the duck's neck, it means uh, a sudden need of more energy. What happens then? What happens around 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. when all of us are at home and you know we are uh, using more energy? Uh, we have what we call as the peaking plants. Uh, those peaking plants are um, are you know thermal plants uh, which are just sitting idle throughout the day for that particular moment when we all are, are at home and we need more electricity just to avoid brownout or blackout, you know, uh, just for grid harmonization, we have these plants which are sitting idle for the for the whole day and just peaking at that particular moment to, to supplement the extra, uh, you know, energy, energy demand. Now TDV, what is TDV? Um, it is it is the it is the time of use rate um, which is only used in the state of California when you are doing a performance path uh, for 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 compliance. You know, uh, now TDV values the energy which is used differently uh, for a different for each hour of the day, each each day of the month, each month of the year. It values it uh, energy used differently for consumers, to the utility system, and to the society. Now TDV is a flexible tool. When we call the TDV values, uh, it is you know it is um, it has three things. One is it is differentiated by energy commodity, whether you are using electricity, you're using natural gas, or you're using propane. It uh, varies by location um, depending on different climate zones. Uh, it you know you have different energy costs uh, for delivering uh, the energy to your house, and it also uh, it gets differentiated by uh, residential or non-residential. So those are the three things that you know. You when you look at the TDV multipliers, it's basically 16 climate zones times three um, energy commodity times two building use. We need to multiply those things to see those are the TDV multipliers that we have all play with when when you're doing an energy model. Okay, so what exactly is TDV made up of? You know, so this particular uh, graph that you're seeing or the picture that you're seeing is a sample TDV shape of an electric energy use of an electric energy use for a 30 year residential uh, in a climate zone 12. Uh, what that is made up of is a lot of factors. You have transmission and distribution, you have capacity, you have the renewable portfolio stand, um, RPS adders, you have emissions, you have your losses, you have energy, so a lot of these factors go into those each TDV multipliers for that particular hour of the day. So when I call, when I say, oh, in January 1st, in climate zone 12, a residential building um, at 6 p.m. will have a TDV multiplier of 30. That 30 is made up of all these factors and all these miscellaneous uh, costs. How, what, what changes are we going to expect in 2019? The generation capacity and TND capacity have shifted to the later in the evening. What that means is, um, as you, if, if you recall, two slides back when I was when I showed you that graph uh, of you know the of the of the neck uh, the duck's neck, um, we when we when we are all at home, you know, at five or six p.m., uh, we need more energy. We need more electricity than before. So what that means is the the plants, uh, the utility plants need more generation capacity and more distribution and transmission capacity uh, in the later part of the day. As a result, the TDV peaks much later in the afternoon, um, to which is more you know coincident with the evening cooling peak, uh, peaks that we have been seeing. On the other hand, TDV is much lower during the middle of the day in 2019 compared to 2016. Now what that means is your solar generation and export is lower 
in 2019 than what it is in the 2016 CDB. This particular picture can will will explain everything. Um, same same um, you know utility commodity like electric um, for a 2016 TDV versus a 2019 TDV. When you see on the on the left hand side, you are seeing those two humps that I use, that I call like to call them. One peaks at around 2 p.m. or 3 p.m., which means you know you have uh, high temperature uh, outside. You have uh, you know more heat loss or more heat gain. You need to have you need to use more more energy during that time, and the other one peaks at around 6 p.m. when we are all at home. That was in the 2016. What happens in 2019? There is only one peak, and that peak is significant. That peak that around it peaks around 52 kBTU per k kilowatt hour, as compared to like 32, um, you know, in 2016. Um, so, if I'm an energy consultant or if I'm a builder, um, what that means to me is I need to look at those measures which will save energy, just not during the peak time uh, between 12 and 4 p.m. or 12 and 5 p.m. I need to look at those measures which will save energy uh, throughout the day. You know, so basically your envelope measures, your PV, your battery, your your HVAC uh, upgrades. Next one, what is coming in 2019? So under the 2019 uh, goals, or what some people are calling it the ZNE goals, uh, you know the the standards uh, have been have been structured to to send the right signal to the market, uh, to you know so that we have we are moving towards uh, the full ZNE in the next code cycle, uh, and how that can be achieved is through your envelope efficiency, um, making more more uh, upgrades to your envelope then appropriately sizing your PV panels so that you have you know, grid harmonization. You don't disrupt the grid. You don't just want to install a 6KW PV panel or an 8KW PV panel uh, and not do any energy efficiency in your home. We, it's, a, it's a combination of both. You, know, you need to do more energy efficiency and you need to do the right sizing of the PV panels to achieve ZNE. and uh, so the 2019 energy code, uh, what you're seeing on the screen is uh, the efficiency increase or the efficiency improvements all the way from 2005 code to 2019 code. So when I say 2005 um, and I say 15%, what that means is compared to the previous code cycle, the 2005 code cycle had a 15% efficiency improvement overall. 2008, it was 14%. 2013 saw 30% improvement. 2016 is 28%, and 2019 it goes back to 15%. Um, and these are all from uh, studies done by the Energy Commission. So all those numbers are coming from their website. Um, the significant changes that are, that is that are coming in the 2019 code is high performance walls, high performance attic. High performance fenestration. Uh, the other, the last thing which most people are not liking or most people have raised objection is QII is becoming prescriptive. And in the next few slides, we'll be we'll be going over those in detail. Uh, but I just wanted to you know put everything in one slide. Um, what what else is changing in 2019 code? Uh, there is something called a target energy design rating, target EDR, that's coming up in the 2019 code. And there will be two target EDRs, one for energy efficiency and another one for PV generation. Um, and lastly, uh, the PV offset option is, is being removed uh, from the 2019 code. And again, before I jump in into the next few slides, um, I'd just like to take a moment and say that a lot of these changes um, have been finalized or are in the process of getting finalized, but until and unless we see a more confirmation draft uh, report from the Energy Commission. Um, you know, don't take my word for that. Don't sue me. You know, um, just wanted to say that. All right. So high performance for walls. How has that changed in the last two code cycles? In the 2013 code, uh, the prescriptive U factor was 0 0.065. Then in 2016, after doing some studies, they said. All right, for climate zone one to five, we'll reduce the U factor to 0 0.051, uh, but for climate zone six and seven, it's not cost effective, so we'll leave it at 0 0.065. 
and for climate zone 8 to 16 it's again 0 0.051 What's happening in 2019 is that U factor is going more lower. So in climate zone one and climate zone 11 to 16, it is going to 0 0.043. For the other climate zones, it's either remaining at 0 0.051 or 0 0.065. Now, what does a U factor of 0 0.043 looks like to a, you know, a builder? It means an R21 cavity insulation plus an R7 exterior insulation that's how you can achieve. Now, I know a lot of people might not like it, but that's how the Energy Commission has come up with those values. They have done some market research, market studies, they have interviewed a lot of builders, and they have come up with that number. Uh, now, again, those numbers can change, but we are not sure. As of, as of now, uh, the last I checked with uh, on their website and different other sources, this is how it looks like for the 2019 code. Now, common wall framing options, you know, for, for 0 0.043, uh, if you are having a two by six framing, you need a two, you know, 21, R21 cavity insulation and R7 exterior insulation. If you have an R, uh, if you have a two by four framing, you need an R13 cavity insulation and R12 exterior insulation. So these are just some of the combination that I've listed. In the next slide, I will be talking about more combinations by, you know, by how you can achieve those U factors. You know, so what you're looking in your screen now is uh, different framing options, two by four, two by six, two by eight, uh, whether it's 16 uh, inches uh, on center or if it's 24 inch on center. So let's, let's take an example. If you have a 16 inch on center and you have a two by four wall, the way to achieve a 0 0.03, uh, 0 0.043, U factor is to have an R12 of exterior insulation and R13 of cavity insulation. If you have a two by six framing, if you are and you're having an R22 cavity insulation, you only need an R8 exterior uh, insulation to achieve that U factor. Um, and then if you have a 24 inch on center, there are different combinations by by you by by which you can achieve that U factor. Now, what are the other um, options to achieve, um, you know, lower U factors and be more efficient than the prescriptive requirement? You have the continuous insulation options. You have different materials which have a pretty high R, R value per inch that you can use. Um, you know, some of them are EPS, XPS, um, you know, foil phase, glass fiber phase um, materials. Alternative wall assembly options are also there. You know, you can have a staggered stud walls. You can have more sheathing options. You know, to achieve uh, a lower U factor. Again, what the what the commission is saying that 0 0.043 U factor is is the lowest uh, or is the least efficient way is the you know is the least efficient design. They are encouraging. They always encourage the builders and the energy consultant to go a little, um, you know, higher than those values, right? Uh, to uh, to beat the code and get into, you know, get um, make your buildings more energy efficient and go move towards the ME. So that was for the high performance wall. Um, that's how the code is changing. The next one is high performance attic. Now in the 2019 code, um, what they are saying is the 2016 HPA option A is going away, you know, they have removed it. Um, so instead of having a prescriptive requirement, uh, they are encouraging the users to go to a performance path, you know, for an above tech insulation. So under 2019, you'll only have option A or option B. Now, option A basically means high performance attic. And option B means condition attic. Uh, option A for climate zone four and eight through 16, again, the, the climate zones that are not listed there, you don't have a requirement there. Um, for an option A, you need to have a vented attic. If you're having an airspace, you need an R19 insulation or R25 if there is no airspace. Um, the ceiling insulation needs to be R38. You need to have a radiant barrier. You need to have an R8 uh, duct insulation and a 5% uh, duct leakage. Well, for an option B, which is a condition attic, it has to be a vented attic. 
it has to be an R30 or R38 ceiling insulation. Um, you know, only again, it's climate zone specific. You need to have a radiant barrier and the ducts have to be verified uh, to be located entirely in conditioned space. Uh, so that's, you know, in one slide, how the high performance attic is changing um, in 2019 code. Again, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to post it uh, and I'll answer uh, them towards the end of the webinar. Um, moving on, high performance windows or high performance fenestration. How is it changing? So, so you know, like the, for the high performance uh, fenestration, their maximum U factor has, uh, is, has, has gone down from 0 0.32 to 0 0.3. And your SHGC has been changed, you know, for your different climate zone, whether it is minimum SHGC or maximum SHGC, uh, depending on those climate zones. So that's how the code is changing for 2019 for high performance fenestration. Next one is your quality insulation inspection. Now, up until 2019, uh, you know, the QII was that magic button that the energy consultant or the builders will use at the end of you know um, all their upgrades to get more compliance credit, more efficiency, uh, more um, uh, yeah, more compliance credit and more incentives. You know, if you're participating in the CAP program, um, starting 2019 code, that QII magic button is gone. It has become a prescriptive. So what that means is. If you're not doing QII, um, A, you will not get credit, and B, you'll get penalty, you know, uh, starting 2019. So, and I've been on that uh, different websites and I've been seeing responses from different stakeholders, uh, you know, telling Energy Commission that how difficult it is um, with, with, you know, each uh, new court cycle. So they wanted CEC to, you know, leave QII out of the prescriptive requirement. But the last I've checked, it is still there as a prescriptive requirement. So I would like to believe that the commission wants to proceed with, you know, having QII as prescriptive measure. Uh, next one is domestic hot water system. There's, there is some changes happening in the 2019 code uh, when it comes to DHW systems. Now we all know that the prescriptive requirement, the prescriptive DHW system is an instantaneous water heater of 200,000 BTU per hour or less. No storage tank, um, it can be gas or propane, but it has to be instantaneous. Um, the code has also listed out two other options, but they are not your prescriptive um, options in the energy model. Um, the second option that you're looking at your screen is a single gas or propane storage um, water heater with, an, with a rating of 105,000 BTU per hour and less than 55 gallon storage tank. In the next slide, I'll be going more in detail about this option too. And the third option is an electric water heater with a tank of less than 55 gallon. I'll be talking about this option as well uh, in the next slide. So option two, what if a builder wants to put in, you know, a gas uh, storage water heater of 100,000 BTU per hour and a 50 gallon tank? He or she can do that, you know, there's no problem in that. But what they also need to do is they need to add one other thing from this list, A, B, or C. Either they need to do a compact hot water distribution system, which has to be, again, field verified, or all of their domestic hot water piping have to be insulated and field verified, or they can do a drain heat water recovery system that is field verified. And if they are doing you know, option C or drain water heat recovery, they need to have um, you know, the following two things. Um, one is a 42% uh, effectiveness. And second, the, the, your, DH, uh, your drain water heat recovery shall recover you know, at least your, the heat from your master bathroom and be able to transfer that heat uh, to the other uh, showers or, you know, the, or your water heater. So those are the requirements. Um, 
from just looking at it you know it looks like it's they're making it really harder if somebody wants to do this option but again they're not they're writing the code for for everyone they they, they cannot be partial to instantaneous water heater or storage water heaters uh, but if you are doing a storage water heater these are your options in the 2019 code now if you want to do an electric water heater what that what does that mean um, is if you are in climate zone 2 through 15 you need to have uh, your pv system need to have an additional 0.3 kilowatt capacity in the coming uh, slides, I, I would go over uh, the PV requirements for, for the 2019 code. There are some specific ED PV requirements for, for each climate zone. So for example, um, just using hypothetical numbers, if you have a house located in climate zone one, and according to the code, the, the prescriptive solar PV requirement is 2KW, and if you want to put an electric water heater in climate zone two, that is, you need to have a 2.3 kW panel uh, PV system because that extra 0.3 is to support these electric resistance water heaters. Um, and if you're located in climate zone 1 and 16, you need to have a 1.1 kW system. What that means is, in in those two climate zones, one and one climate zone 1 and climate zone 16, because of the weather conditions, your heat pump is will you know they're they, they think that it will go more towards the electric resistance mode. It will require more heating, uh, more supplement heating. So you need to have more PV system capacity. The exception for for this uh, for these two, uh, you know, um, options are either if you put a near rated uh, heat pump, uh, a tier three uh, specific uh, specification uh, heat pump in climate zone two through fifteen. That is an exception. Or in climate zone one and 16, you can use the same near rated uh, heat pump with a 0.3 kW uh, PV system, not a 1.1 kW. Uh, but again, you know, I I personally haven't seen people putting electric resistant water heater, but the code is written again for for everyone. Um, so that's that's all for the DHW side. A lot has lot is changing. Um, when it comes to the 2019 code, PV compliance credit. So this is this was the credit that the builders and the energy consultant could take in the 2016 code. This is gone. This will not. This this is not applicable for the 2019 code. Um, now what what they are saying is uh, the PV compliance credit was only given for for you know smooth transition from the 2013 code to 2016 and they, what they what they meaning the commission is saying is starting 2019 code all new construction have to have pv systems installed in their house um, so the prescriptive pv requirements under the 2019 code so the equation that you're seeing on the screen is how um, each climate zone will uh, will will have its own prescriptive PV system capacity. Um, so, for example, um, if you have a 2,700 square feet home in climate zone one, uh, looking at the table on the right side um, and putting those factors in, you need at least a 3.408 uh, kW PV system. Now, I haven't seen the the, the calculations, but that particular 3.408 kW PV system relates or translates to an EDR score that the builder and the energy consultant have to beat uh, in order to qualify. So that is, you know, I've, I have some tables out there. Uh, I think Energy Commission has some tables out there um, that I didn't want it to put in this slide because they're, I think they're still working on it. Uh, at least that's the last I heard. Um, but if they have finalized it, it will be in the code. And you will be able to see what um, your prescriptive PV requirement is for that climate zone. There are some exceptions to that on-site PV, uh, and those excep exceptions include um, any dwelling unit you know approved prior to January 1st, 2020. They can take that, uh, you know, those will be considered as an exception. Or 
if you know external to the dwelling unit there are some uh, barriers but which are not limited to trees hills and adjacent sort of structures that is considered as an as an exception um, now if you are doing if you are in climate zone 15 you can use a reduced pv system for uh, for just that particular climate zone and if you have a pv if you have a single family which is three stories you don't need to have uh, the pv system based on your climate your condition floor area you can allow uh, a reduced pv system for those for those um, projects you know and the last exception is if you are using a battery storage system then of course you can you can go with a lower pv system um, so what is edr as as by now you know most of you know that edr stands for energy design rating and it is a home energy index um, that uses you know td values to come up with a score a whole house energy efficiency metric uh, edr of 100 is your reference home which is a 2006 you know iecc compliant home now edr of 0 means a zne building so that's how that's the metric and that's the scale on which each house is being uh, judged upon and given incentives at least in this particular uh, court cycle in the 2016 um, now in the 2019 they are changing the definition to what we call is the target energy design rating target edr now that target edr basically means um, you take your energy efficiency EDR and you subtract your PV EDR from that, and that is your final target EDR. Um, when when the when the code is finalized and everything, the CAP program will also change its uh, uh, its you know program requirements for 2019. We still have two more years to go, but I just wanted to you know uh, show this to you all of you to see uh, to you know. To just see how the code is changing and what on what metric you your project will be judged uh, in the 2019 code. So you'll have two EDRs. One is for energy efficiency and one is for PV EDRs. And you know, subtraction of those two will give you your final target EDRs. This is um, what I got from from the CBEC Res beta version for the 2019 code. And this is how I I believe if they don't do a significant change. Uh, how it will look. So what you're looking on your screen is your standard efficiency EDR of 43.2. Then because you did some energy efficiency improvements, your building envelope, your your HVAC, you have a proposed efficiency EDR of 41.9. Your proposed, uh, proposed EDR is lower than standard. Good, you're good to come in the program. Um, what what is on this side now is 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 a new thing for the 2019 EDR of minimum required PV. So this is just a 2,700 square feet home located in climate zone 12. Each climate zone, again, as I said, depending on your your condition floor area, will have a prescriptive PV system size. That prescriptive PV system size will translate to an EDR score. You have to come higher than that EDR score. You have to beat that EDR score. Now, what some people might think, all right, what if I don't do any 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 energy efficiency, you know, and my standard, uh, my proposed efficiency is 43.2, uh, but I install a 7kW PV panel when my P, my prescriptive requirement was three, for example. Of course, this, you know, EDR will go higher, but that doesn't mean you can come in the program, in the CAP program, because you need to have energy efficiency and PV to come up with this final EDR score. So the subtraction of these two, you know, again, we have not yet designed the program. We still have two more years. Uh, we might go with, you know, Delta EDR approach again for the 2019 code. But this is how the builders and the energy consultants have to work together to, to decide on how much PV system size, how much battery storage, or how much energy efficiency improvement they need to do in order to beat your final standard design EDR. Um, now, what are the advant advantages of those EDRs? You know, it establishes a performance benchmark, just like your other performance paths. 
when it comes to wall, attic, uh, fenestration. Um, so you know your target EDR uses the same same you know principle. Um, what we have seen um, is that industry appreciates uh, options available. All right. So CEC stated that the many people appreciated the fact that when we transitioned to the 2016 code, there was a PV offset option. <clears throat> Now, when we are transitioning to the 2019 code, there will be more options available for for the builders. You know, you are not tied down to just using the prescriptive wall and window and roof uh, U factors. They know that it is very difficult. It is uh, it is a big economic you know undertaking to achieve those U factors. Um, but there are you know other options available for that. And by doing that, what it does is it sends the right signal to the market that we are looking at energy efficiency, we are looking at PV sizing, we are looking at demand response and also flexibility. Um, and then, you know, it also allows builders to use more efficiency and less PV. By doing all these things, it provides the credit for your demand response and flexibility. You, you achieve a grid harmonization just are not putting more panels and disrupting the grid. That's another big concern that the Energy Commission is facing and is looking in the future. Um, so all this uh, was the reason for achieving, for coming up with a target EDR for uh, climate zone specific, depending on uh, you know your condition floor area and your PV system size. Um, now, you know, we are in, Towards the end of the webinar, uh, any questions, Alison? Yeah, we have a couple. Um, okay. So, is there no longer a way to use solar thermal for offset of electric resistance? Um, there is, there is, um, but it's for the multiple dwelling units. It's not for single homes. I haven't seen one, uh, the draft version of the of the standards. I haven't seen that there. Okay. Um, how is the 2019 code dealing with PV from coastal areas, especially in climate zone one, uh, where there is little or no air conditioning and energy use is peaking in the winter? Um, I believe, I believe, and you know, I haven't seen the final numbers, but if I'm comparing the same home located in climate zone one and let's say climate zone 10, the PV system size will be smaller. It, because you know your heating loads will be lower, so I think all that factor has already been taken into consideration by people working at you know working at the Energy Commission. Uh, but yes, what I've seen is people raising concerns that uh, you know PV system size, your you know your higher SHGC values, you know or the low U factors uh, is uh, creating um, and you know negative impact for those projects uh, in certain climate zones. But again, I think they are looking at it for the whole state. And uh, sometimes, this is just my personal uh, belief that sometimes some climate zone are treated unfairly. But at the end of the day, um, that's how uh, every climate zone will be, will, will be treated, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so on the EDR of standard efficiency of 43.2, uh, what uh -huh. are the units? Is it KBTU per square foot per hour or um, a percentage of a HERS 100 house? Um, that's, that's on the TDV because uh, that's how the 2016 code uh, EDR is also based on. So there's a, there's a difference between that. Uh, between TDV and EDR, let me let me just clear that for everyone. Uh, when when we talk about TDV for program, we talk about regulated loads. But EDR, uh, let me just go a few slides back. So EDR, the first point, as you can see, it's a home energy metric that you know takes into account all the end uses. That also includes your plug loads. That also includes your uh, washer and dryer um, and cooking appliances. So that's how uh, I think the 2019 EDR will also be based on. All righty. Um, <clears throat> must affordable multifamily projects achieve Z&E by 2020 or 2030? It's 2030 for now. Um, 
I haven't seen any movement in the multifamily market uh, when it comes to ZE. But you know, again, I don't talk to much people, so you know, I, uh, when it comes to multifamily, my focus is on new construction, single family. So I can't speak much about that. All right, and the last question is. For multifamily buildings, is air leakage testing required for each dwelling unit? Uh, no, that's the last I checked in the code. Uh, but you know, I'll be happy to send the link to the final draft version for you know the prescriptive requirements of single family and multifamily to the audience. Um, that's already written by the by the commission, and that's why I said most of these values have been finalized. Um, and people can go and re, you know refer to those uh, specific areas of their interest. Um. All right, we actually did have one more come in. Um, can you explain how the EDR works with regard to ZE? The example showed a result of EDR of twenty four point seven, but this doesn't seem to be ZE. So that was just an example. Again. Um, because I just took a prototype and I just ran a model and I just you know used the CEC prototype. And again, uh, I don't know if uh, many people know uh, about this on the call that the CEC prototypes are you know some of the prototypes are typical square buildings. So it has equal doors and equal windows on each side. Um, you know that's not how the real world works. Uh, but if you have an actual home, um, you need to have you know an EDR. Uh, requirement of you know 24.7. That's how it will be. Um, one thing that uh, I also wanted to add is EDR of zero can never be achievable. And this is what I found after reading a few articles. You know that you still have your plug loads. You still have your those non-regulated loads, which have not been taken into consideration. So you know EDR. Many people think, oh, it's a ZNE home. It should have an EDR of zero, but that's not the case. You know. The EDRs will go down significantly for your, you know, standard and your proposed. Proposed is is in the user hand, but standard will go down significantly. But I've never seen any prototype given giving a zero EDR. So that's just uh, that's my understanding, you know. Um. All right. Um. So those are all of the questions so far. Um. And anything else that comes in, we can we can follow up to you directly. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you, Ritesh, for sharing your knowledge with everyone. All right, thank you, guys.